advocate Bharachok is the founder of the Chambers of Bharachok. He should be secured first rank in Delhi Judicial uh, Exams in 2011 and since 2016 he has been practicing in the courts of Delhi. He is a member in the Young Singapore International Arbitration Center and also sits on the, as the board of trustees and advisor of Satya Pro Bono and attempts to bridge the gap between access of justice between marginalized people. Okay, sure. So, uh, thank you for having me and uh, when, you know, before I start, uh, let me just put this out at the very outset. I'm hardly, hardly equipped or experienced or qualified to speak to this audience. I've never studied teaching or pedagogy or something like that in any formal discipline. I'm hardly a, I'm not an alien myself. So I don't think I'm the right guy at all. But uh, what I've done really over the last few years is, the last 12 years that I spent in law, I graduated in 2011 from Jamia. So what I've done over the last 12 years is, I've had the occasion of interacting with law in a few different capacities. First as a somebody who wanted to be a judge, then as a baby magistrate of 23 years, and then three years that I spent there, then as a lawyer at a law firm and otherwise. So I was telling uh, Rohit this that you know over this period of 12 years I've uh, had the great fortune of uh, looking at the legal system with multiple lenses and also understanding as to what is it that can make somebody a marginally better lawyer or a better judge, what is it that we somehow uh, can work on and we've not been working on for a number of reasons. So I come for, to this topic and this issue from that, that standpoint. I mean, it's never stopped any lawyer from, you know, speaking about something, the fact that they know nothing about it. Uh, but what I've done really is this. Actually, I had a quiz for you guys, but because of technical uh, issues, we could not play it. I thought it's too late in the day. Let me get you guys to pick out your phone, scan the QR code, and we'll play a few games. But yeah, same, same uh, emotion. Uh, so, but that, that's fine. What I'll do is now I'll try to uh, create that to the best of my ability without the uh, aid of a PPT or a screen. Uh, so that, that's where I am. We're not doing the quiz, but I'll still put the questions to you and uh, share my thoughts with you and then in turn take from you what I can. Uh, so I again, as I said, I come at this topic as an outsider, as somebody who, I mean, I, I've been to a few colleges and spoken about things in a few academies, but I'm not a teacher at all. Uh, so uh, pardon me for any, you know, uh, anything that I say which may not be accurate or correct from your very, very, uh, you know, uh, expert standpoint. Uh, another preferentary remark is this, that some of the things that I talk about uh, may sound a little strongly worded, but I believe that words in order to have any real impact have to be an assault of the senses. So in order for any, and you guys, you know, uh, sort of take the lead and tell us how the law ought to be, while we lawyers as mercenaries go and play it out on this is the law, this is not the law, that's where we normally stop. But you obviously take it way beyond and then you talk about how law ought to be. So you'll be able to obviously appreciate some of these much better than I do. But I try and push the envelopes of jurisprudence in that sense. But take a lawyer as they say and put the lawyer in a time machine and take him back to the 17th century, a lawyer would feel right at home. Because a lot of what we argue on a daily basis hasn't really changed. And same for judges to some extent. We just love precedent and convention. We are also, and this is again the second preferentary remark that I make, we are also, uh, we have delusions of grandeur. Too highly of ourselves. We think that, you know, we, 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 when, a law, when a client comes to us or a litigant comes to us, the litigant or the client is looking for a, for a, for a rock star lawyer. That's not what they're looking for at all. They're looking for a solution, right? They're looking for a cure. So that outcome-based thinking, again, is something that I want to come back to in a little bit. And I also want to say this at the very outset, that uh, again, these are the two uh, broad themes. But let me, let me just uh, freely associate, and please feel free to come in with your questions and your thoughts. Uh, over the last few years, uh, I found myself answering questions without or arguing cases or deciding cases at one point without any formal training on how do you decide whether GST applies on online gaming or whether a particular online game is a game of skill or a game of chance. I have also found myself advising people on how do you enforce an emergency arbitral award in a jurisdiction which does not recognize your system of law. I found myself, much to my disappointment, 
uh, advising and actually arguing in an arbitration which had three arbitrators, one from a civil law, one from a common law and one from a hybrid jurisdiction. I have had clients come to me and tell me we want to start a cryptocurrency. <coughs> How do we do this? And whether we can do this? Somebody wanted to start an exchange. I have advised people and absolutely no skill at it, okay? And the law I also feel is a lot, uh, there's a lot missing there also. Data theft under the IPC. You know, that's the kind of issues that I've had to advise on. Uh, I've had to advise on the right to be forgotten, for instance. I've had to be, I've, I've had to advise on how do you interpret contracts, what is the test of an official bystander. Uh, as soon as I got into the profession, I was, uh, I was, I was made from day one to talk to police officers on criminal investigations. Now, no college, I, I know for a fact, has prepared anyone for that ever. I've had to cross-examine. Now, obviously, some colleges are trying now to uh, also teach softer skills like uh, trying to get the truth out of a client, which is a task in itself. Anyone who's uh, practiced would uh, vouch for that. How do you get facts out of the clients? How do you cross-examine? How do you uh, uh, speak to an investigator? Forensics is a big, big gap in uh, uh, what we've been doing so far uh, in the law colleges. Maybe, maybe the situation is somewhat better now. How do you cross-examine a handwriting expert? How do you examine a ballistics expert? How do you examine somebody who talks only about blood stains? You know, all of those things. Uh, every case has an electronic evidence component, for instance. Uh, but how many of us know how to prove an email in a court of law? You know, somebody would tell us, oh, go file a 65B certificate from the Evidence Act. Or 65B certificate, you know, and if you read the section, I'm sure most of us have read it at some point. It raises more questions than it answers. Now, 65B of the Evidence Act, which makes electronic evidence admissible in a court of law, is one of the most convoluted and complex, and needlessly so, sections that have ever been there. UK has done away with it, by the way, where we took it from initially, but we continue with it. But nobody's told us who, what these certificates are, who is to give them, how do you prove an email, as I said, in a court of law, what is metadata, what is an IP address, what is a MAC address, when we were studying Cyber Law or IT Act or the Evidence Act. Uh, nobody's taught us uh, on how internal investigations work if you've got a fraud within your company. How do you internally investigate? How do you report it to the regulator? Uh, we've had, how, how do you have a fee-related discussion with the client? You know, one of the biggest problems as a young lawyer uh, at 21 when I meet a prospective client at a barista because I didn't have an office of my own. I didn't know how to have that difficult conversation on fees with the client. How do I ask him for fees? And what if he doesn't pay the consultation and I have to pay the coffee myself? <laughs> uh, princely amount of 150, 200 bucks back in the day 2011, even then it, was, it used to cost that much. Nobody taught me for that. If you take up a case, what do you have to do? Do you want to sign up Do you? Is it privileged or what can you, uh, you know, how do you conduct yourself? So a lot was missing, you know. Uh, when I started practicing on the criminal law side, Rukka, Muchalka, uh, Fard Inksaf, uh, you know, super dari, uh, nama, you know, all of these terms I had absolutely no freaking clue about when I was made to work with them. So colloquial terms, uh, forms, notorious forms in the courts, process fee, talbana, uh, kaise usko bharte hai, how do you file inspect, how do you get that out, so softer skills. Uh, also what kind of a conversation can you have with a, with a witness? Nobody's ever taught us that in a law school, you know. You have a case, you're fighting it, you have a witness who wants to depose from your side. Kis tarah ki baat hum us witness se kar sakte hai? Can we ask the witness to say this or not that? Can we just understand from the witness what the witness is going to say? Can we even have a conference with the witness before the witness is going to depose? At what point does it become tutoring from a discussion with the witness? You know, many of these skills again is something uh, I personally found myself lacking and I've, I've worked with a number of younger colleagues over the last few years and I thought this is something that we can work on. I only have problems as you can see, I only have questions. I don't have a lot of solutions today but I thought let me take it since misery loves company to a wider audience so that they can possibly travel as well. So uh, that's, that's, that's the idea. Interconnections. You know we've read, we've had great professors teaching us subjects. But the truly great among them were the ones who interconnected different statutes and told us what the first principles are. Uh, how does CPC speak to that section in the Evidence Act? How does the PMLA speak to IBC? How does uh, uh, CRPC speak to Money Laundering Act? Uh, how, what part of CRPC also applies on a money laundering investigation or a crime or a trial? Uh, 
I have not had anyone talk to me about dispute avoidance, dispute containment, you know, very, very important areas. I don't know if there are professors of ADR here or mediation. But again, uh, we need, you know, uh, uh, more focus on dispute avoidance, dispute containment. Legal risk management is, you know, one of the buzzwords that we speak to clients about. That, you know, we'll come and do a legal audit for you. We try to find out vulnerabilities and how you do business and where would be the next legal case coming from and then stop it before it arises, you know. But that again needs a certain kind of training, a certain kind of eye, a certain kind of uh, strategic view of different offenses, different compliances. So again, that's something that we can possibly uh, talk to our kids about. And I've not even started now on data and AI and, you know, those fancier, fancier terms or a blockchain or a smart contract. Actually, my quiz was a lot more fun than I am. And uh, <laughs> it, I promise you that maybe on some other occasion we'll get to do that and so on. So at one point we were brainstorming how to make this come up on a smart contract together where you can have an ECS mandate. The client may not agree to give you that, but let's assume that the client does agree to give you that. Then you can have that money be credited to your account automatically based on the number of computers it's using. There are many, many other applications of uh, smart contracts that we've uh, we've uh, had a look at, you know, some of them are quite, quite striking. For example, farmer insurance, um, not to just give you a very easiest application of it. You know, farmer insurance, for example, if it rains beyond a particular a millimeter in a particular jurisdiction, then why is the, the claim not being dispersed to the farmer's account directly, self-executingly, without anyone having to sue somebody or give a legal notice or somebody having to it? Why can't we connect the system that gives a farmer insurance money as soon as rain hits a particular threshold, which can be objectively verified from a system, from a third party, from an umpire, from the weather department. So, you know, these are applications of smart contracts. Now, but the questions that arise are, is it compatible with the Indian contract at again? Do you have consensus at item? Can you get an injunction if you are the insurance company and you think something is wrong? Equally, uh, and I was reading this uh, in uh, in this amazing book by Yuval Noah Harari, where he talks about the fact that, for example, you have an insurance, life insurance, we all have them. And the next time you take a drag from the cigarette of a friend at the next party, your insurance policy automatically becomes white. You know? And they know everything, right? They don't need to put sensors on you in order to understand that. Right? Privacy is history, much of what we used to talk about. In this so they get to know that you've done this. And if your insurance policy is voided, because it's a violation of your insurance policy, you can't be smoking. And they void your insurance policy, again, how do you test it on the basis of existing legal principles? Is it an okay contract? Or was this a standard form, a dotted line that you were made to sign? And that is not executable in a court of law? Was there undue influence? What is the quality of bargaining power, bargaining positions? How would a student of the existing contract law look at this problem and advise it? help the client or maybe the company understand it better. Right. Similarly, and there can be endless, endless examples on this one uh, issue only. For instance, you have a car loan and you miss the installment. Now the car company has the ability to disable your car remotely. Now, multiple considerations arise, right, for something as simple as that. What if you were driving the car at that point? Or if there would be some check and balance where you can't disable the car while somebody is driving remotely because they have not paid the installment. There might be other concerns. Maybe you are not driving at that point, but there is no grace period involved, right? You may, be, you may be insolvent at that point. You may have somebody in your family who has got cancer and who is at the hospital. And you want to take them to the hospital, but the company has disabled your car. So there are ethical problems. There are, there are problems of uh, whether this would stand scrutiny in a court of law. And how do we prepare our future lawyers, future judges to deal with uh, problems such as this? Now something as simple as this, I was arguing this case uh, before the division bench in Aurangabad where an ex-employee of my client had taken away very, very important and valuable data. So there was an FIR under the IPC, there was an FIR under the Information Technology Act. Information Technology Act is easier to understand, unauthorized use of data, 43 read with 66 of the IT Act. Police had also invoked 379 of the IPC. Now 379 of the IPC, when you look at it, it says that if you take away or you move property belonging to somebody and you move it in order to take it out of the possession of that person with a dishonest intent as theft. But then when, when, you, when you start you know, joining the dots backwards, what is a property? Then you go to section 22. 22 says that it's only a property which is corporeal in nature, it has to be tangible in nature. 
So any property which is intangible is not really property for the purpose of IPC. And then your charge collapses. Now there is apparently a Bombay High Court decision which says that the moment you have a computer being used in an offence, then I, IT Act being the more special law, takes over the general law and the IPC takes a vaccine. Now in this particular case of data theft, I feel that the IT Act is not sufficient, it's a bailable offence and so on. So even if you don't apply IPC, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a problem, but it can be a bigger problem. So the judgment said, and just test this for a moment with me. The judgment said that the moment there is a computer involved in offence, IT Act is the more special law, IPC takes a vaccine. And it laid it down as a legal pro proposition. You, know, you can almost call it the ratio of the case. Now I have to convince the bench on how this is not the correct ratio of the case. I said, look at the consequences if you agree with this principle. Now there is a driverless car. I am a hacker of, of, of some expertise. And I make the brakes go fail on the vehicle remotely. Now that's hacking. There's no dispute that it's hacking. You gain unauthorized access into the system of, or the internet of the car, or the motherboard of the car, or the computer of the car. And you use the computer to do it. And you cause murder actually in 302. You kill somebody with the intention of causing their death. So definitionally it's murder. But just because the computer is used, you can't say the special law takes over because the special law doesn't provide for it at all. And that's a bailable offence, punishable with a maximum of three years. So sometimes, you know, you lay down a proposition at the intersection of technology and law. You will apply in 1860. <coughs> would not have thought in his mind that he will be applying this law on a situation like this. And then you take a new situation and then you hold something down and you lay something down as a proposition of law. It is extremely, extremely problematic. Again, uh, are we having enough conversations about it? How do we make this a part of uh, the curriculum where maybe the lawyers and judges can engage with this? Or I just had a few questions and so on, as I told you at the very outset, and I thought I'd uh, take, you, take these to you. A bunch of other problems uh, as far as AI is concerned. We've all heard right now the New York Times suit against Chad GPT, right? That talk about uh, copyright infringement. Now, I'm no IPR lawyer, but I understand there are issues <coughs> worthy of examination here. What if this software of yours has read everything that New York Times ever wrote? and understood it and internalized it to the extent that it started talking like the New York Times. <coughs> and you know, many of these papers, many of these authors would have a very distinctive narrative, distinctive tone, uh, you know, uh, in terms of precision, in terms of a particular style, and it ultimately starts speaking like those persons. So I was actually doing this yesterday. Uh, I'm working on a book which has got something to do with legal principles, and I, one of my favorite authors is this guy called Ambrose Pierce who was somewhere in the 19th century, he wrote this famous book called The Devil's Dictionary, where he took everything from A to Z, and then he will take up ordinary words, and then uh, give them a very witty and uh, sarcastic sort of a meaning. For example, he de defines <coughs> egoism, or egocentric as uh, somebody who has the bad taste of being more interested in him than me, you know, something like that. So he's, he's come up with these very interesting definitions. So I was writing a book on principles and I have. So many of the principles could define it here, Ambrose. Thay. Otherwise, it would have been a good uh, springboard for me to start the book. But I told Chat GPT 4, and I've had substantial conversations with Chat GPT over the last few months. Don't think I don't have friends. I have <laughs> friends too. Uh, some of them, I think they're friends. I consider them friends. Okay. So I, I, I asked Chat GPT 4, Kia ki principles ki na mujhe us tarah ki definition chahiye jaise wo likhte the aur unhone likhi nahi we can't bring him back now he's been dead for 200 years and i said write it in the manner that he did and gpt4 obviously did a fantastic job in it where it did define uh, principles in a manner that i think he would have the way he used to think the way his brain was wired so uh, is there a problem here now this man is long gone you know maybe somebody is alive and you get Chat GPT to do a better Salman Rushdie than Salman Rushdie. Yeah. Or do a, you know, are you taking away personhood? Are you, is it identity theft? I don't know. Is there a problem with it? I don't know how copyright infringement law works. But uh, I, I'll just leave you uh, with, with that thought. And uh, I think these are going to be the questions that we are going to have to answer, decide, teach. And all of these are interconnected things. And I think I'll just stop by saying that uh, it's important that we cannibalize ourselves because if we don't, somebody else will. Uh, history, civilization, everything's told us that nobody's indispensable. 
So uh, I think it's important for us to see what are the sort of things that are needed. I mean, I I I, I made it a point today while I was you know putting my notes together for this effort. What is the kind of lawyer or a judge who would replace me? You know, if uh, or is it a person at all? And let me be that so that I'm not cannibalized. So let me cannibalize myself in that sense. And you know, just talking about judges, we've had this discussion at judicial academies across the country on how far is it okay for us to have the assistance of an AI system to decide bail applications. You know, on an ordinary day, uh, a, a munsev or a magistrate decides 15, 20 bail applications. All of them, you have the bail application, you have the police reply, you have the previous conviction report, you have a bunch of other evidences to help you decide. Can we take help? Should we take help? Uh, who decides what are the sort of considerations that we'll write into the AI software? Is the AI going to become as biased as we are? Is it going to discriminate against a particular section on the basis of probabilities? What if it says that you know people from a certain area are known to commit more crimes? Therefore, there is a greater flight risk. Let's deny that person bail. Is that problematic? I think it is problematic. How far we use it? Again, a skill that we'll have to talk about because in many, many jurisdictions now, many of you may be aware, there are systems which are advising judges very, very actively on what the sentence should be, on whether this is the case of parole or not. And in many, many respects, they may be better than judges. You know, we've all heard the example of those Israeli judges where you'll have a parole decision right before lunch and right after lunch. And the chances of you getting parole go astronomically up if you have your case after lunch. But if you say that, people are scandalized, you know. Um, no, we are very self-aware, very self-conscious. Uh, objectively decide karte evidence ke base pe. But you don't know, it's happening to you. Fast for 10 hours and then decide something and have a decent conversation with your friend, you know. You know. So again, technology coming in to help, but at the same time you setting the guardrails. Uh, thank you for, very much for this opportunity, it was a very brief uh, thing. Maybe we'll do the quiz some other day. Um, and uh, uh, let's continue to strive. Stay relevant, build newer skill sets, and uh, thank you very much for having me.